Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or have been sitting in the shadows and you enjoy what you are hearing, please make friends with that subscribe button and his best friend, the notification bell. Make sure you set that one to all so you don't miss every time I upload a video, which happens to be daily. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, that information can be found down below. Now, I know some of you may be wondering, what is this Rosie Rose, this weird thumbnail that Phoenix doesn't do? For those of you who have been in my live chats, you've met the mod, Rosie Rose. Rosie Rose and I began working together about two to three years ago. She is a writer. All of her publications are on Reddit, and I fell in love with her writing. So I would like to introduce you all to whom Rosie is and why I fell in love with her literature. So, with that being said, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a comment down below and show Rosie Rose some love. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled Phantasms by Rosie Rose. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right before the story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Oh, and I almost forgot. This story is also broken up into three parts. So, as I read along, I'll let you know which one is part one, part two, and part three. Here we go. Part 1. In 1748, I was offered a gift I couldn't refuse. I regret it now. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. That's how the quote goes, but for me, my greed led to my destruction. In 1748, I, along with family and other members of my village, fell ill to a plague. I knew I was bound to die like the others in my town. It was then that a strange man visited me, and he offered me a gift. A gift no one in my predicament could refuse. Immortality. I was delirious from the plague and agreed to his terms, without even listening to them. I didn't want to die, and the thought of immortality sparked a feeling of greed within me. As soon as I agreed to his terms, he vanished into thin air. I had almost thought I hallucinated the whole incident, but my rapidly improving condition proved it actually happened. Needless to say, I was gleeful of it and went to see my family. My joy lasted for a short while until I realized this gift was in fact a curse. I watched my family die one by one each suffering in the last moments. I watched as they each suffered, not being able to do a thing. No matter how much I prayed, the strange man did not return. The last of my family to go was my baby sister, who I held in my arms as she breathed her last breath. I wept for days and wandered around the village, not bothering to eat or drink. What was the use? I couldn't die, so... What was the point? I would call out to the strange man to come and retract his gift, but nothing worked. It wasn't long before the survivors of the plague grew suspicious of me. They wanted to burn me at the stake, even though the witch hunt from years prior had calmed down. This prompted me to leave the village and travel. I traveled to multiple places until I settled down in a small town. I tried to enjoy my life there as much as I could, and I did find some peace of mind. It wasn't long before I met the person who soon became the love of my life. She was as beautiful as a flower and as gentle as the sunshine. Despite the curse of immortality, I found myself falling for her charm. After weeks of getting to know each other, we were together. Like a fool. I placed my immortality to the back of my mind. Months after we were together, we were engaged in planning to be married. 
"'Twas the night before our wedding day that I was jolted from the paradise I foolishly placed myself in. I received word from my lover's brother that she had suddenly come down sick. I rushed to their home to be at her bedside. I held her hand as the village physician checked over the worsening condition. His face was grim as he told us the dreadful news. Her family and I wept at her bedside. I held her hand tightly as I constantly told her how much I loved her and what she meant to me. With a hoarse voice, she whispered words of endearment to me before she passed. The cause of her illness was unknown, but I just knew it was because of me. That suspicion was confirmed when I looked up and spotted the same strange man standing on the corner side of her bed. I fell back in shock, startling the family. My shock soon turned to rage as I belittled him and asked what he wanted from me. Her family looked at me as if I were crazy, but I don't care. The man stared at me before responding. You should have listened to my terms. This put the fire in my heart out as I was dragged out of the room. I was thrown out and told to get my head together. Apparently, they couldn't see the strange man. Once again, I wandered around the town and into the woods, wishing more than never to die. I barely had the energy to lift my feet from the ground and tripped on a tree root. I fell and laid there for what seemed like hours. I heard a sinister laugh and looked up to see that man again. I didn't even have the energy to yell and curse at him. I just felt hollow. Can you take your gift back? I asked instead. He laughed. <laughs> Once the gift has been given, it cannot be returned. You should have listened to my conditions before agreeing. I cursed myself. Can you at least tell me what the conditions were? I don't see any harm in that, so I might as well. There were three conditions. The first of the three provided you with a perfect memory, making you unable to forget a single thing. The second of the three, if you are to receive a fatal injury to mortals, you will die momentarily and experience the pain tenfold. And finally, the third condition. Anyone you love will die. He responded after much contemplation. I pulled myself up to my knees as my stomach twisted. I felt sick just listening to the conditions. I couldn't even get mad at him because it was my own fault that this happened. He vanished into thin air once more, leaving me to my own devices. I curled up as small as I could as sobs racked my body. After this, I moved from place to place, never staying for long. I kept my distance from people as much as I could, fearing that I might bring about their death as well. I continued like this until 1823. In 1823, I experienced the second of the three conditions. I was roaming the woods somewhat close to a town, but I didn't pay much attention to it. I had just passed behind a large tree when I was struck in the neck by a bullet. It shattered my esophagus and blood gushed from my neck. I grabbed at my neck to stop the bleeding, but it was too late. I went unconscious and continuously experienced that pain tenfold. It was like my very own personal hell. It was then that I developed a fear of death, even though I couldn't die. I wasn't sure how much time had passed when I regained consciousness, but the sun was rising once more. The last I remember before I fell unconscious is that it was midday. My neck arched as I remembered the pain, and I immediately grabbed it. 
Thankfully, everything was healed up as if nothing happened. But I couldn't forget it. Even to this day, I can vividly remember that pain. But it was not the worst I experienced. In 1940, I was in England when the bombing, the Blitz, occurred. I was close to where a fire bomb hit. Not only was I burned alive, but I was hit by debris and broke many of my bones. I was out more than a week and experienced that pain tenfold, continuously with no break. After that, I experienced night terrors reliving the pain all over again. The night terrors continued on for months after the bombing. It was so bad that I opted to not sleep. Due to this, I decided to go into hiding from the world. I didn't mind traveling around previously, but technology was quickly advancing. The possibility of me being suspected weighed on me. After that, I watched as the world around me advanced to where it is now. I still traveled from location to location, but I tried to make it as discreetly as possible. This didn't work out in my favor, as an unnamed organization caught a whiff of my existence. It was mainly my fault. I stayed in a city longer than I should have, and I got unwanted attention. I won't go into all the details of how I was kidnapped by the organization, as it really isn't necessary. Many ways, 15 years ago, I was kidnapped and tortured by that organization. Naturally, when I was kidnapped, I put up a pretty good fight and one of their agents ended up killing me. Even though I was dead, they took me with them to discard my body, only for me to wake up a few hours later. This prompted them to run various experiments on me to uncover the secret of my immortality. From electrocuting me, to poisoning me, to decapitating me, they tortured me in the name of science. They claimed they were doing this for the betterment of humans, but I highly doubted it. Each time I was killed, I relived that torture for countless years. I was their test subject for a good four years. I only escaped because my body finally gave out from all the various torture. They killed me via lethal injection and because of the constant torture I experienced, it took longer than they expected it for me to heal and wake up. I guess they decided to discard me, since none of their research proved fruitful. So they disposed of my body, and I woke up about a month later. Throughout that month, I relived all the torture I experienced. Upon waking up, I refused to sleep for months, and I avoided people altogether. I lived in the woods as I thought of ways to destroy the organization. Thankfully, the organization was shut down by the government. After it was discovered, they experimented on humans. While I felt at ease not having to worry about that organization, it still took me years to be able to go out into the public. Even now, I still tremble in fear from the thought of being discovered again. But that is why I move so frequently. A new city, new job, and a new name. While I try to go on about my life, I still catch glimpses of that man out of the corner of my eye and hear his sinister laugh echo in my head. I'm not sure of who or what he is, but I do know he isn't some nice, helpful person. I'm sure many of you reading this will feel pity more than being scared of my story. But I didn't come here for pity. I've made my peace with the decisions that I made that led me to this point and regret them. I was foolish, and now I'm suffering the consequences. You don't have to believe me. I don't care. I'm merely writing this to be a warning to others. If you ever are in a dire situation and you meet a strange man offering you a gift, you need to refuse it.
part two. In 1824, I encountered a real life vampire hunter. Okay, wow, I wasn't expecting that much attention from my previous story. I had fun reading everyone's comments and replying to them. I think that was the most interaction I had with other people in the last six months. Anyways, one person had asked me about some of my other experiences, which prompted me to write another story. I will only talk about one experience for this story. I have a lot to write, but if you'd like to hear more about my other experiences, here you go. Okay, so yes, you read the title right. I encountered a real-life vampire hunter. This happened after the incident in 1823, where I was shot in the neck. Apparently, I was shot by a hunter, and upon discovering he shot a human, he ran back to his town and didn't say anything in fear of what people would think. Well, fast forward a few days, and he finally cracks and tells his family. The family then decided to find my body and bury it in the woods, so no one would know. Unfortunately for both them and me, I had already awakened and had visited that town. They used his hunting dog to track my scent to where I was laid in the woods, but I was no longer there. Not knowing what to do, they went back into town when a hunter spotted me. Vem, vampire, he shouted in fear. Multiple people look around and began whispering, I looked around as well. I mean, I didn't think he was talking about me. That was until he pointed to me. It's him. He's the vampire. I was naturally taken aback by this. Did he honestly think I was a vampire? How did he come to that conclusion? And then it clicked. As just days prior, I was shot in the neck. Before I could respond, a town resident responded. You're crazy. Vampires don't exist. And even if they did, they wouldn't be in the sunlight. The hunter's family came to his defense. It's true. He shot the man in the neck, and he went to go to the woods to bury his body, but he was gone. What else is he if not a vampire? A silence settled over the people as they nervously looked at me. I had to leave. Sure, they can't kill me, but I'd rather not experience the pain of a wooden stake in the heart. I ran, pushing people aside. This caused some to erupt in screams. I guess thinking I was going to hurt them. Finding a horse, I jumped on it and rode it as fast as I could go. After that, I tried to keep away from towns. Who knows how fast the news spreads. I'm sure some would find it ridiculous that there was a vampire sighting, but others would believe the townspeople and hunt me down. Or, in other words, vampire hunters. I know what it sounds like, but even in the early 1800s, there still existed vampire hunters. Did they ever actually kill vampires? No. The most people killed were those who went comatose with a barely noticeable heartbeat and buried alive. Some woke up and were able to escape their coffins, and some ended up dying. Those who lived and tried to go back home were labeled as a vampire and killed. It's quite sad, really. Anyways... Fast forward two months, and it is now 1824. I visited quite a big city, a mistake on my part. As I walked through the city, I noticed someone was following me. While I may only be immortal, being alive for almost a hundred years by this point has sharpened my senses, so I could easily tell I was being followed. I turned down an alleyway quickly and hid out of the follower's sight. As I suspected, he rushed into the alleyway but didn't see me. He stood there for a few minutes and I contemplated 
if I should show myself. Before I made up my mind, he left the alleyway quickly. I breathed a sigh of relief and left the alleyway on the opposite end. I found an inn on the outskirts of the city and paid for my stay there. There weren't a lot of people here, so I figured it wouldn't hurt to stay inside for the night. I wished I had just decided to stay outside for the night. However, I was sitting in my room on my bed reading a book. Upon hearing a knock on my door, I got up and answered it. Before I could even react, a stake was stabbed into my chest and punctured my heart. I grabbed at the stake as I got a good look at the man. How did he find me? My knees hit the floor as blood pooled in my mouth before running down my chin. I coughed, choking on the blood. This is what you deserve, you deceitful vampire, he said with disdain. I paid no attention to him as fear clouded in my mind. No, 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 no. I don't want to experience this pain tenfold. I tried whatever I could to keep a grasp on my slipping consciousness. Please, not again. I don't want to do this again. I pleaded my mind, hoping for mercy. Before I knew it, I was reliving that pain. I relived the moment over and over again. The pain increased by tenfold. I cried out to the strange man for a reprieve from this pain. But... I was met with silence. Eventually, I woke to the soft, grainy feeling of dirt. My eyes shot open just before the dirt landed on me. I looked up at the man that had stabbed me in the heart. His eyes were wide with disbelief as he saw me alive. The stake was still in my chest, so I grabbed it and pulled it out. It hurt for a moment before the wound healed. How, how, how is that possible? He stuttered out. I struggled up, not bothering to answer him. I, I stabbed you in the heart with a stake. I poured holy water over you and blessed your body. How are you not dead? He yelled out as he fell back. I finally made it out of the grave and stared at him. My body shuddered as it remembered the pain I had just experienced. My mind trembled as I continually replayed that moment over and over. I bent over and hurled the little food I had in my system. I finally got my bearings and paid attention to the man. You. Who are you? <laughs> Why should I tell you that? He retorted. I mean, you don't have to, but you made me experience the pain again. I'm not feeling the best at the moment, so I advise you to answer me before I decide what to do with you, I responded in a monotone voice. This diminished what little pride he had left. I, I, I'm a vampire hunter. And I was told of a man fitting your description, surviving a bullet to the neck. Naturally, I rushed to that town to receive a drawing of what you look like. I, I, I just don't get it. How are you not dead? <sighs> That's a long story, but I'm not a vampire, I said with a sigh. Just leave. Get out of here. I didn't have to tell him twice as he quickly scrambled towards his horse and left. I finally looked around at my surroundings and realized I was at a church. I couldn't help but to sigh once more as I started walking down the road as well. You may think this is the end of this experience, but you are unfortunately wrong. You know those bullies where, by themselves, you can scare them off, but they later came back with their other bully friends and gang up on you. Yeah, that's this guy, except his friends had guns and stakes. 
A good four months into 1824, I ran into him and his friends. Before I explain that little incident, please remember that while I am immortal and pride myself on my fighting skills, I'm not invulnerable, have super strength and endless stamina. Fighting six people with weapons is not easy. Anyways, after the incident before, I tried to stick to just camping in the woods and only passing through cities and towns when I had no other choice. Days prior, I had noticed that I was being tailed, but I could never find the people. They would disappear when I searched for them. I tried not to focus on it because I figured I was just being paranoid. While I was camped out in the woods that night, I was ambushed by six attackers, all of which had weapons such as gun, swords, and stakes. I just started drifting off to sleep when I heard a twig snap. This jolted me awake as I looked around. Before I knew it, the sound of a gun went off and I instinctively dodged the bullet, but it still struck me in the side. I clenched my teeth as the pain burned throughout my body. Show yourself, I shouted out. And like that, six people emerged from the darkness of the trees. The only one I recognized was that man from four months prior. You, didn't you figure out that stakes don't work? I hissed. It's different now, demon. We know how to kill you, he responded. I couldn't help but to laugh out of both anger and fear. <laughs> yeah, sure, whatever you say. But didn't you run away last time with your tail between your legs? His face contorted. I was merely making a tactical retreat. You were much more dangerous than a vampire. It couldn't be helped. Before I had a chance to respond, one of the members of his group shot their gun at me again. I couldn't move in time and it struck me in the leg. I yelped in pain and went down on one knee. Three of them then rushed at me with their swords drawn. I stood back up and protected my vital spots, taking most of my slashes on my arms and legs. My skin burned as it was cut by the sharp blades. Blood dripped from the wounds and splattered onto the ground before they could heal. I found an opening and tackled one of them to the ground, removing his sword. I now had the sword and sliced the arms of the others. But before I could move in, I was shot at once more. A bullet grazed my cheek while another lodged itself into my arm. By now, I was breathing heavily and exhausted. My wounds were healing, but it still didn't mean the pain didn't slow me down. After making a large swing at them, I took off running into the woods. My leg that had gotten shot was just now healing after my flesh pushed the bullet from the wound. I ran as fast as I could from both adrenaline and fear. The memory of being staked was still seared painfully into my mind, as was the pain I had experienced. I could hear them hot on my trail, their shouts echoing throughout the woods. Couldn't they just leave me be? What the hell is wrong with them? I ran as fast as I could before my heart sank to my stomach. From ahead, I could hear the rushing water of a waterfall. I picked up my pace before skidding to a halt at a cliff that stood above water. The waterfall was feet from me. I looked back at my pursuers and decided right then and there. Taking a few steps back, I ran and launched myself from the cliff. I noticed a root just below. If I timed it right, I could grab it and cling to the cliff's edge. I plummeted and, like some miracle, I grabbed a hold of the root, breaking my arm. I clenched my teeth as I grabbed it with my other hand, 
I basically dug my nails into the rocky edge and laid evenly across it as much as I could. I heard the pursuers above. He really jumped, didn't he? Another one sighed. Eh, he's long gone now. The current was a taking him away quickly. Damn it. Just when we had him, the sly devil just had to weasel himself out of it. An all too familiar voice responded. It's all right, Joshua. We will track him down again. Another said. I heard their footsteps grow distant, but waited there for what felt like hours. My arm fully healed and I began climbing up the cliff. It wasn't that far down from where I was, but one wrong move and I was falling into that water. From this height, I'd shatter my bones. Finally, after almost 15 grueling minutes, I reached the top and pulled myself over the cliff. I laid flat on my back as I took in deep breaths. I laid there for the longest time, replaying the events that had just transpired in my mind. I get up eventually and discreetly made my way from the forest and away from that region altogether. Ever since then, I stayed off their radar and didn't appear around the public until I traveled to England. Well, that's the end of this experience I had with real-life vampire hunters. I'm glad I never encountered them again. It was quite the frightening experience, especially since I was still mentally recovering from being shot in the neck and experiencing that hell for the first time. My advice is, if you ever encounter someone with a stake and crucifix, run the opposite direction as fast as you can. Part 3. The man that gave me this gift paid me a visit. I had figured he would appear when I made my first post, but when he didn't, I was shocked. When I made my second post, there was still silence for a while. But when he finally appeared before me, the meeting wasn't pleasant. Two weeks ago, I had just gotten home and realized something wasn't right. I haven't yet turned on the light, but my instincts warned me of something in the room. The air was chilling and filled with static, a familiar presence that still sends shivers down my spine. I hurried and flipped on the light and came face to face with that strange man. <sighs> Why are you here? I asked. He neither laughed nor smiled like before. Did you think you could just tell thousands of people of this gift I gave you without repercussions? I froze, unable to move. I should have known that was why he came to visit me. Things like this mustn't be discussed or told, but yet... You told thousands. Normally, I'd collect on the debt and enslave your soul. But you've been a great source of entertainment for me these past 200 years. So, I'll give you a small punishment, he continued. I trembled. What do you mean? His laugh echoed throughout my apartment. <laughs> You'll know soon enough. And just like that, he disappeared into thin air. The room became warm once more. But I was left cold. What he said chilled my blood. He would have normally enslaved my soul, but he didn't. He instead planned for me to be punished some other way. I tried to calm my nerves, but my hands shook violently and kept me awake. Yet with terrifying sadness, I fell asleep. I awoke to sunlight shining brightly into my eyes. 
I was outside, but how? I sat up, and that's when I saw her. My lover, Iris. She was seated beside me. Uh, uh, Iris? I called out. She turned with a bright smile. Did you have a nice nap? I looked around confused. What was all this? Wait, no, not a dream, but a memory. I blinked multiple times, but I didn't wake up. This is real. Iris now had a concerned look on her face. Um, sweetie, are you all right? She asked. I turned to her slowly. I... <sighs> it's just something isn't right. I couldn't help the tears that had now fallen. I finally got to see her again. She hurried to me. What's wrong? Why are you crying? I shook my head. Maybe everything that had happened was the dream, and I finally woke up. Like a fool, I let myself be submerged into the illusion. Um, nothing. I just had a really bad dream, I assured. She smiled. <laughs> Let's head back. I nodded, and we left our picnic and headed back to her home. Our walk was peaceful, and I felt myself slipping more. Then, pulling me out of brief joy, a loud gunshot rang out, and I immediately looked around. What the hell was that? Let's hurry home, Iris, I said. Her grip on my arm tightened, and I looked at her. Her complexion was bad. Iris, what's wrong? She moved her hand from her chest, where I saw blood soaking her dress. Elliot. El my heart dropped in fear as she collapsed. I caught her and tried to apply pressure on the wound. Hang on, Iris. Just hang on, I shouted. Somebody, please help. I looked and saw not one person making a move. They stared at us in shock. I looked back down to Iris, who was growing colder by the minute. I scooped her up and ran towards the doctor. I was halfway there when her body went limp. I collapsed on the ground, tears falling from my eyes. I held her and hugged her for the longest time my sobs growing in volume. I don't know how long I was there, but eventually, someone pulled me from her. Iris! I stopped short as I saw her blood soaked dress. Her head was tilted down, her face out of sight. I Iris? I asked as I walked up to her. It was then she lifted her head, and I saw her decomposing face. I jumped back as Iris lunged at me. I fell to the floor with her on top of me. It's all because of you. All because of you. If only it wasn't for you, I'd be alive. I wouldn't look like this. It's your fault I died. She shrilled. Her hands wrapped around my throat and tightened. I struggled to breathe, but I knew this wouldn't kill me. It still shocked and scared me to my core, seeing Iris like this. I know, Iris. I know it's not my fault that you died. I wanted to say this, but couldn't. Tears built up in my eyes once more. Iris was like this because of me. My vision faded in and out until it finally went black. I woke up coughing and breathing heavily on my apartment floor. I looked around, confused. It was already daylight outside. I struggled up and walked to my bathroom. I looked in the mirror and saw the clear strangle marks on my neck. Everything that just happened was a dream. Well, the last part. That picnic was a memory. I shuddered as I thought through everything. This was all my punishment. It had to have been. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that Iris's voice, when she was strangling me, didn't sound like her at all. 
It sounded like that strange man. I covered my mouth. I felt sick to my stomach. He was the cause of that horrible dream. I should have known. I knew what that strange man was trying to say. He wanted me to know that there was more than one type of pain that could be that could be inflicted upon me. And if I didn't stop now, and if I didn't stop, he'd co look. The iris I knew wouldn't have blamed me. Even if it was my fault, she died. After that, I stayed at home for days, going over everything that happened in my dream continuously. I knew what that strange man was trying to say. He wanted me to know that there was more than one type of pain that could be inflicted upon me. And if I didn't stop, he caused even more mental pain. He said I was a good source of entertainment. I was nothing but a toy for him to play with, till he was bored. I still tremble, thinking about it. I don't know what to do. Just the mere thought of him coming back and manipulating my memories and dreams like that makes me afraid. I am in anguish. The dream comes back to haunt me day and night. Seeing my lover like that, it broke something in me. I've been trying so hard all these years to stay strong, but that image of her broke me. That dream broke me. I had always known that it was because of me that Iris died, but bearing that shattered something within me. I've reverted back to how I was when she first died. No energy and no will. I just wish I could die, but even then I'd be tormented. My soul was that strange man's plaything. I am in a paradox, not wanting to live, but also not able to die. Please, I know how I sound, but someone, please help me. I don't care how, just please, someone assure me that things will get better. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to Rosie Rose's Phantasm. I would like to take a moment and say thank you, Rosie, for allowing me to narrate a beautiful piece of literature. For those wondering, you can find Rosie on Reddit, and of course she's always active here whenever I go live. I will link her Reddit page down below in case you want to read more of her stories. Granted, I will be recording more of her. With all of that being said, I would like to give a very special thank you to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Mrs. Innerscare, Sugared Spite, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Chris Elias, Tina Mead, Cindy, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Lus Crispin, Patty Sneese, Denise S, Kwame Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support, for without that, I would not have a voice. Thank you. If you are dreaming, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this beautiful piece of literature written by Rosie Rose. In the meantime, please take care of yourself and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all. <laughs>